Um, great, so hi. Uh, I'm, uh, I'll introduce myself in a second, but I'm Monty. Uh, this is, as Stuart said, the um, uh, talk on NDB bindings. Um, well, what words did I use? Use the MySQL cluster NDB API from language you actually like for fun and profit. He's right, that is a little bit long, I'm sorry. Um, and hopefully uh, you're here for LinuxConf AU. Um, if you're not, you're <laughs> drastically in the wrong place. Um, so uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about um, NDB and, wow, this is really sort of weird not having it in front of me. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stand, I'm out of camera then, aren't I? That's not really important. Um, so uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about the NDB, what, what NDB is, uh, what the NDB API is. Um, this is one of these things where um, we, have, we have a couple of terms, a couple of things that are referred to by different terms and a couple of terms that refer to different things and then marketing people got involved. Um, so we all know where that goes. Um, that's me, I'm Monty, that was me before, after, after a hike, it doesn't really matter. Um, I hike, that's one of the things I do. Um, I am a, I'm a hacker for Sun Microsystems, I work on the Drizzle project, uh, formerly with MySQL, uh, came over in the acquisition, so I, I got bought for a billion dollars, I'm that important. Um, if you were all MySQL people, you'd really, you'd really chuckle at the, the I'm not that Monty joke, but it, it doesn't quite work as well. I'm here, I'm from Seattle, Washington, um, uh, hiking, camping, long walks on the beach, went to Burning Man, all that type of stuff, it's fun. I keep looking at this like it's actually got slides on it right here, and it so doesn't have slides on it. I mean, it has slides on it, but it has a different presentation up. So anyway. Um, so the things we're going to talk about uh, real briefly is uh, MySQL cluster, um, a.k.a. NDB. Um, then, because to talk about an API to something, you really want to talk about the thing that the API is going to interface with so that we know what the heck that thing is. Um, and then that gets us all the way to the actual topic of the talk, um, which is the NDB bindings, which are using those, using all of that upper knowledge above that on the slide um, uh, for fun and profit, um, and, uh, and how we can not write everything that we do in C++. Um, and I'm going to mention, uh, actually, when I was working on this slide, I thought that I was going to talk more about mod NDB, but in fact, instead I'm just going to give you a link, because, um, well, I decided to go to bed. Um, and also, it was getting long. Um, as an apology, I tend to run over um, on these things. So anyway, um, so the question number one uh, on our list of things we're going to talk about is, is MySQL cluster. What is it? Um, MySQL cluster itself is it's a product name. Um, it refers to a combination of the MySQL database with the NDB storage engine and one or more uh, things running uh, the the NDB daemons themselves. So so it's a it's a MySQL cluster is a is a, a clustered database system, which means that obviously you're going to run more than one. You don't have to run more than one thing. I've got it on my laptop, but more more than likely you're going to uh, you're you're going to be running more than one node of of things. Um, but the 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 piece of 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 cluster, which is actually the of MySQL cluster that we're we're talking the most about, is is sort of the core part that doesn't actually have anything to do with MySQL. Um, uh, MySQL is merely an implementation of an API client. It happens to be the one that is the most convenient for um, most people to use, um, but it, it is it is merely one of of many um, uh, possible. So um, so I'm going to try my best to from here on out refer to it as NDB as opposed to MySQL cluster because it really it's really unimportant the MySQL cluster part. Um, so, uh, this next section of slides is lovingly stolen from Stuart, um, and, and then, yeah, so I think, actually, you know, we, we might co-own these slides by now, because I think I've used them enough. Um, oh, he's brought water. That's fantastic. So, NDB is a high availability, high performance, in memory, shared nothing, chlorate, clustered, storage engine. Yay. So, it's a uh, high availability. Um, that is, means that it's designed for five nines. It's designed for 99.999% uptime. Um, it, I think it is actually achieved that for one of our customers. Um, it's designed for, uh, for sub-second failover, um, meaning that if you've got some MySQL D uh, clients and you've got some data nodes running things and one of them dies, woohoo, hey, they just keep talking to the one that's still up and all of your stuff are happy. Um, it's got a configurable amount of redundancy. Um, so one of the configuration parameters is number of replicas. Woo, yay. Uh, it's actually a configuration parameter that makes sense when you look at what the name of it is. Um, not, never mind, I'm gonna skip that. So, uh, 
So you could have one replica, which means you've got four nodes, you've got a piece of data, and it's split four ways on four machines. This is actually a really stupid idea. You shouldn't do that. Um, because, well, then one and all, you know, you're, anyway, the more machines you add, the more likely you are to lose your entire database. <laughs> um, so don't do that. Um, the most common thing for people to do is number of replicas equals two. Um, you've got two copies of any given piece of data on, you know, on, uh, eight, you've got a copy of any given shard of data on, in, on two machines at any one given point in time. Um, you'd also do number of replicas equals four. Um, this is possible. Uh, it also sort of moves more towards the ludicrous and retarded side of things because it doesn't really add you all that much more. And it means that you've got to buy a lot more machines. But if you really want to do that, that's, that's great. That's fantastic. You know, go for it. Um, and also buy me a machine while you're doing that, if you would, because I need some more in my apartment. Um, it's high performance. Um, this, is not, this is not intended to be high performance in terms of begin to commit. This is, this is done through parallelism. Um, so, uh, you know, what the heck is that slide supposed to be, Stuart? Um, that's when it's like transactions going on. Oh, that's what that is. All right, great. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, the idea here is, is that, 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 you can, that you can do more things at, at any one given point in time, but any one of those transactions isn't necessarily going to be faster than a local transaction against a local, uh, a local you know, buffer memory pool or something like that. In fact, nine times out of 10, it will not be as fast. Um, as doing that, unless you're using the API and the other one's using SQL, in which case the thing's going to have to parse the SQL, but we'll get to that. Um, so a, a, a quick, for those of you that are into speed, um, the, a, a quick plug for how fast it, it can be um, in general, however, is for, for simple primary key lookup type operations, um, it's, it's pretty much the same speed as memcached, um, except it checkpoints to disk and it has secondary indexes and things of that nature. So um, what's that? And it's much harder to configure than memcached. But you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, everybody, go replace memcached with MySQL cluster. Um, that wouldn't be the thing that you want to do. Uh, but on the other hand, if you've got some of those things where you're, you need that sort, of, that sort of speed, and occasionally you also need to do this other weird thing, too, um, it, it can actually keep up with, with that um, thing. It is in memory. This means that the data and indexes, although this is changing over time, uh, the data and indexes need to be able to fit entirely in memory. This does not mean that it is only stored in memory, um, but this means that, that everything has to fit in memory as uh, across, the, the, across the number of nodes that you've got. Um, so, so the amount of memory that you've got per node is the size of your database times the number of replicas you've got times a little bit of a fudge factor divided by the number of nodes that you've got. So if you've got two replicas and four data nodes, then each uh, each, in, each individual machine needs to be able to store half of your total data size for anybody that's doing that much math in their head this early in the morning. Just trust me, it works out that way. Um, it's in memory, but we do checkpoint to disk. Um, this, is, this is the thing that, the, that as much as marketing people get paid lots of money and, and they do wonderful jobs, uh, seems to get, the message seems to get lost the most frequently, which is, yes, it's an in-memory database. No, your data doesn't all go away if you lose power, um, because that would be the world's worst database ever, um, or really not so much a database as much as a cache. Um, what? Oh, there is, there is a diskless mode that you can run it in. Um, but. Uh, it really does. It really does. It's, it's really good on your disks to run it in diskless mode, except for the times when it doesn't save you to disk I.O. when it's broken. But um, did you see that bug? Anyway, there was a bug. Anyway, uh, it was a couple years ago. Uh, so anyway, so you don't have a complete data loss after power outage. Um, so the, the, we, we get into arguments sometimes with people about durability and stuff like that. Um, it, it's, it's considered durable not when it's written to disk, but because it's been written to multiple machines. Um, it, it, it checkpoints the disk asynchronously. Um, the idea here is, and I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this out there, that it's, it's, it's much more likely that you're, you're going to throw spindles in a, in a, in a lot of disks than, than actually lose an entire multiple machines at the same millisecond. But, you know, we can argue about that later. Um, it's shared nothing. Um, this means it's designed to work on commodity PCs. This is really terrible for the guys that bought MySQL uh, for us because we, we have salespeople that like to sell really expensive machines. And, um, and, and I'm like, well, no, you, can, you should really just go, in fact, this expensive machine runs worse with this software. Why don't you go buy a $1,000 machine from, from the supermarket um, and, and, and please use that, and then I get death threats. Um, uh, I can use commodity interconnects, no expensive shared disks, so there's no SANs involved. It's, it's like literally you can set up a, a, a pretty high performance cluster on a, on a, on a nice budget. 
Um, well, nice budget for a company, not nice budget for me personally. Yes? Mm -hmm. No, so in the case where one dies, there is, so if, you, if, you're at a, if your number of replicas equals two, sort of the standard thing, and one of your nodes dies, then you, for, for however many fragments of the data are, were, were on that node and one other node, then those, those nodes are, are unredundant during, that, during the period of time that that node is down. Um, so if that, so which is a reason that we will actually see people do two or four, uh, two or four node uh, replica, excuse me, three or, or four numbers of, of replicas out there, less three so much than four, but yeah. What's that? Uh, yeah, but you'd still have to plug it in. Like, you, the, a hot spare, not, not a one that's connected to the cluster, where you could have a, an extra machine that you could plug in, and it would, it would re-sync up with the, with the things, but yeah, there's... Yeah. Although, so uh, oh. if you get to the big enough data here and you have to restore from scratch, no, it depends on how you have an hour. Uh, you can also have a you can also have uh, non-index uh, costs and then options. Uh, okay, so some of that you can listen to me. Yeah, if you, or you have a lot of that. People do buy, so you can do all Yeah, and put many, many, many of them there, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh yeah, I should I should mention that that this was this was originally written was it 15 years ago by Ericsson? Yeah. 50, about 15 years ago. It started, the product the, the the thing started off Ericsson then spun it off as its own company, then we bought it, then uh, the MySQL bought it, then Sun bought it through buying MySQL. So the the development team has been working on this has been bouncing companies for a while. Um but uh, in fact, not to go too far on a tangent, it was originally written in a, in a programming language called Plex. Um, <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> I gotta love that sort of stuff. Um, what's that? Yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> or, or speed. Um, so, it's clustered. Do we explain what that is? Yeah, that, that cloud right there, that, this, this cloud means that these computers are in a cluster. This is, this is where the, the idea of cloud computing comes from. It's from Stuart's slides. Um, and, and these data nodes, they're all, they're all, all running in DBD, which is the, the data node process. Um, so it, it, it's clustered. We, we, split the, we split the data up into, into thing called, things called node groups. Um, so a given node group is going to, is that, that looks backwards to me. Anyway, it's not. It just looks backwards to me at the moment. I'm not saying it's the wrong slide. I'm just like, it's 9.30 in the morning is what I'm saying. Um, so, so you've got, uh, you've got the nodes that, that have this, this fragment of data, um, you know, sort of exist in a, in a node group. So at given points in time for the cluster to come up, you've got to have at least, you've got to have all of the node groups present. That doesn't mean that you've got to have all of the nodes in any given node group present for the cluster to be operational. But you've got to at least have all node groups or else you don't have all your data and then Lord only knows what's going on with your, with your queries. Um, so when we, when we split this up, the, the, the default way to do this, you can, uh, this is this is configurable, but the, the standard way uh, for most things is that uh, internally it does a, it does a hash the primary key and then and then splits things up on the different machines uh, using that. Um, so things get assigned uh, units of data get uh, uh, tuples get assigned. What? Oh, huh? 
MD5. Yeah, hasn't it hasn't really been a bottleneck. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It, so, so far, so far, it is it is not the problem yet. <laughs> um, uh, oh, and it's a storage engine. Um, so for those of you that, that aren't um, complete MySQL heads, um, this is a, this is a thing that's pretty unique to, to MySQL and Drizzle. Um, it's the idea of storing. Uh, you can have you can have different things that that control how how the database stores the rows, and it's actually a per table thing. So you can have uh, a, a schema with multiple tables, and one of the tables can be stored in my ISAM and little files on disk, and one of them can be in cluster. Um, and so it 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 uses the the storage engine API. Um, so but for those of you who might be familiar with other sort of things that that we all use on a more regular basis, this is very similar to the virtual file system layer in uh, in, in Linux. Um, so that you, you have a file system, and underneath that file system, some of your files might be in ext3, some of them might be in butter, you know, um, hopefully nobody is there in riserfs anymore, because then you, they take you to jail too. I'm sorry, that was a really tasteless joke. Um, uh, so, so pretty much, and we'll just, we'll just co opt the same sort of, sort of thing here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Storage Engine API sort of presents a, a, a common layer to the application. So, so application users of, of, of MySQL or Drizzle don't have to know anything about, I mean, they might need to for, for performance reasons, but, but physically they don't actually have to know what, where rows are stored um, for them to do. It's pretty much the exact same reasons that the VFS layer is good um, uh, and stuff like that. So in this case, you could have some stored on disk, some in cluster. Um, I'm going to get, get rid of that Falcon thing. Um, so, uh, so right now the NDB storage engine only exists for MySQL. Uh, we don't have it in Drizzle at the moment um, because we've been busy with other things and we haven't ported it. Um, so, but talk to Stuart about that. Convince him that he needs to finish that. What's that? Well, right, yeah. But, but I mean, it, you know, it, it exists for MySQL. Um, <laughs> so that's that's what we're that's that's the whole NDB thing. That's the MySQL cluster. So. Um, so having, having NDB having a clustered storage engine, um, you've got to have a way to talk to it. Um, and that, in this case, we lovely refer to as the NDB API. Um, the NDB API actually refers to two APIs, which are the NDB API and, and the MGM API. Uh, we're not really going to talk about the management API at, at all. I really just bring that up to point out the fact that there's something called the NDB API that refers to something else called the NDB API and something else, which is sort of lovely recursive and obviously somebody didn't actually think through that naming. Um, so somebody at some point decided that they would try to replace this term with MySQL cluster direct APIs. Um, and I got to tell you, that's six letters. That other thing is several words. Not ever going to happen. Um, so when we, when we show you nice little, little pictures like this, we've got multiple, multiple data nodes, and we've got a, a MySQL daemon sitting over here that stores its data in these data nodes. Um, and there's this, there's this nice thing sort of indicating that this is talking to this cloud of things, which means that they're a cluster, right? Um, so what it uses is it uses the NDB API to do that. It's, it's, a, it's you know, well, it's the API that blah, blah, blah. It's an API. That's what they're used for. Um, but the nice thing is, is that we can use it too. You don't have to be a, a MySQL D. You can be your own, your own thing. Um, so it's a C++ API, um, but don't despair if you don't like C++. Um, and it's what MySQL you to use to talk to a cluster. Um, so this is the part where it gets scary. What does it actually look like? Wah! Um, so uh, so this is this is a a a, a brief um, uh, that that query up there at the top. Select name from my table where ID equals one. This is sort of what that looks like in in, in DB API terms. Um, uh, we're going to we're going to start a transaction right here. We're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna tell it we're gonna get an operation on a on a table. Um, that operation is going to um, be a read tuple operation. Um, we want a tuple where uh, where the ID column is equal to one. Um, we want to get the value. This is actually a bug, by the way. This line. Um, we want to get the value name out of it, and there shouldn't actually be a second parameter to that. Um, <laughs> or actually, you could pass in a pointer with memory that it would use to do some of the buffering. But um, actually, I think that's deprecated now, too. Anyway, so anyway, this is just completely a bug. Um, there's no reason for that second parameter to be there, other than I like to put my name on slides. Um, so we're going we're gonna to get the name value out, right? Select name. So we're going to get the name value out. Uh, and then we're going to execute it and tell it to commit when we do the execution. Um, and of course, after all of these, we've, we've been good and we've checked for errors. 
um, and then we're going we're gonna to close the transaction. Um, so why in the world would you ever want to do that? <laughs> write all of this code when you could just write the select thing. Um, and, uh, and the main reason is it's just faster than crap. Um, it's, it's easily, uh, most of the time, it's about five times faster uh, and, and, and less latent than, uh, than, having, than sending a, a SQL string to a MySQL server, having the MySQL server parse that SQL string, generate this in the back end, because it's going to actually do this, um, and, then, and then send that to the, to the cluster and then return the results to you. Um, I mean, there, there's a whole other computer involved in it. There's a parsing step. Um, it's, uh, well, you know, you're compiling your sum. So this is, a, this is from a benchmark I did. Um, actually, it, I really need to rerun this, because this is from a couple of years ago. So I could probably, oh, sorry, was that a, no? OK. Uh, I should probably really run, rerun this. Um, this, is, uh, this is running um, uh, on a, a MySQL cluster um, doing really simple primary key operations. Um, I think this is about 50% write, 50% uh, read write. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I really need to relabel this too. Um, when it says TPS over here, that's, that's transactions per second in units of thousands. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so up at the upper end here, we're, we're doing 120,000 transactions a second, not 120 transactions a second. Um, but, uh, but so you can see as we're, as this is, um, uh, the different number, the, the lines, there's three different lines there. There are, there are different numbers of data nodes, so two, four, and eight data nodes. Down here, there's um, uh, between one and 16 uh, MySQL servers, and we're, we're uh, shotgunning stuff to all of those uh, MySQL servers. So you can see the line's actually pretty, pretty decently linear until you get up there to the top. The two data node thing can't quite handle 16 data nodes. Um, but but we you know as we add more API processing nodes uh, we get more we get more things and we hit about 120,000 transactions when we max out all of our machines. Um, in this case, that being 16, 24 machines worth of worth of uh, cluster power, um, which were all I believe dual or quad core boxes. I mean they're just standard little AMD boxes. Um, so. So this graph looks sort of similar until you look at how different the scale is on the, on the left-hand side. Um, this is doing the exact same test except using the NDB API to, to, to generate things. So down here we've got API nodes equals, uh, so instead of a MySQL server, we're, we've got an NDB API program, which is the API node in this case. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you see we're actually, we're actually hitting that original saturation point down here with only four API nodes. Um, and uh, yet at the upper bound here with 16, 16 API nodes and eight data nodes were actually more at the, at the 500, um, 500,000 transactions per second and still, still going, really. Uh, I don't have a graph of it, but some, some time by the, end of that, by the end of that benchmark, I think we originally, we eventually got something like 750,000 out of, out of these boxes, um, transactions a second, which is... Yes. Yeah. That's that's that the the the, the new stuff in six four with the multi threaded NDBD. Uh, yeah. Oh. So. Um, so the thing, the other thing I should uh, that I, I neglected to mention is these these uh, up until just recently in code that is about to be released, uh, these uh, the the NDBD nodes themselves are actually. They're, they're essentially single-threaded. They're, they're actually sort of multi-threaded on the back. There's one execution thread and some threads that handle file I.O. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, you know, so anyway. Uh, so, so just a, a brief, uh, a, a sort of a brief uh, overview that we looked at that code. What is it that you can do with this? Um, we're, I said the word storage engine several times earlier. What we're talking about here is we're talking about things in, in, in storage engine uh, storage engine language and storage engine terms. These are the, the sum total of the things that you can do with the NDB API uh, with your data. This is it. You can't do anything else. Everything else is combinations of these things. So six, six different things you can do. You can do a primary key read, a primary key write, a primary key delete. Um, write in there is either both an insert or an update, depending on what it is that you're doing. Um, you can do an index scan, you can do a table scan, and you can do a lookup. I'm sorry, there's a seven. You can do a, you can do a single row lookup on a, on a, you can't really do a, yeah, you can do a single row lookup on a, on a unique, a secondary unique index, or you can scan that index. So this is really, 
Um, it's only six things, anyway. Um, but that's it. All other database, all, all the database operations can essentially be broken down into units of these. That's it. That's what you can do. Um, which is sort of nice. It also means that some of your code gets verbose, because things with large, low numbers of instruction sets tend to get wordy. Um, so, so the thing is, is that nobody really likes C++, which isn't true, because I actually like C++. In fact, a lot of the structs of function pointer stuff that Mark and Stuart both really like, I think, looks like garbage. But, you know, to each his own, they think that what I'm doing looks like garbage, too. So that's, you know, that's perfectly fair. Um, but, but statistically speaking, I will admit that it is much less likely that, that the most, that the majority of the people in this room like C++ than don't like it. Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm willing to stipulate that, that many people would rather write in something that isn't C++ than write in C++. Um, so that's why we, we did what are now lovingly called the NDB bindings. They've been called a couple of different names since then, and, be, and then marketing people got involved. Um, yeah, so, um, so these are wrappers. Uh, we currently have wrappers for uh, Java, Python, Ruby, Perl, C Sharp, and Lua. Uh, the Java and the Python wrappers are the most, um, the most complete, um, mainly because I work for Sun, and um, so Java's important. And uh, I am a Python programmer, um, so Python's important to me. In fact, this started off as a, as a, process, a, a project to write Python wrappers for, for the NDB API. Um, and, and it sort of ballooned from there. But I was like, I want to write Python. Um, uh, the, but the Ruby, Perl, C Sharp, and Lua work. Um, there are some features that, that I haven't entirely wrapped in, in there, um, partially in some cases like in Lua because I don't know anything about Lua. Um, and so writing sensible wrappers <laughs> for Lua <laughs> becomes harder and harder the more in-depth I need to get into making something Lua-like. Um, so we get a nice little, a nice little thing. We've got our data nodes. We've got our, our MySQL DS here. This is sort of a, um, this is this is a standard .com shop where where some bastard has decided that we need to have programs written in all all six of these languages that are talking to our databases um, because you know, well, I'm sure we all know that that happens pretty much everywhere. Um, and this is this is sort of your standard thing, right? You know, uh, in fact, actually, this is even an advanced thing, and they've already they've also got some C++ NDB API programs down here, also talking to the cluster. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, I, you couldn't pay me enough to to actually work for the company that's doing this mess here, but you know, whatever. Um, what's that? No, no, no. I got paid to talk to those companies and tell them they were stupid. There is a there is a drastic difference. <laughs> um, so with the NDB bindings, you can put big, fat, colored lines um, that, that skip the part of talking to MySQL D and unfortunately actually make it look like things are more complicated. And in fact, it actually probably would make things more complicated in this setup. Um, but let's just ignore that fact for right now, um, because then I wouldn't have anything. Um, uh, so the code is stored on Launchpad. It's in Bazaar. Um, uh, the, you can just pull LP colon NDB bindings, uh, and the code will all magically um, appear on your laptop if you have Bazaar installed, that is. If you don't have Bazaar installed, that command will come back with command not found. Um, yes? Bugger. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that, that's, that's me needing to go back and fix the slide, is, is what that is. Um, there, there were bindings for PHP, but then they started to, like, so I, I, I have PHP bindings that will compile. Um, the problem is, is that um, each, each object, and I'll point to it when we, when we get to some of the code sample slides, but um, each time you, you instantiate an NDB cluster connection object, you wind up making a, a, a fully present member of the, of the cluster. Um, and the problem is, is that in PHP, the normal usage of PHP is to use it inside of Apache or Lighty or something like that, um, which means that you, you're spawning and reaping processes all the time. And so if each one of those processes, each one of those processes wouldn't be able to share the cluster connection. Um, so each one of those processes would have to be a, a node itself. And the, the, um, the cluster crosstalk chatter at that point would become uh, ludicrous before it would become useful for an application thing. So it's one of those where like, the, the code sort of works, but we haven't figured out a sensible way to actually, for someone to actually use it. And, you know, so it, it, I've, been, I've been trying to pull the words PHP off of the, off of the stuff, and I've missed this one. Um, but because I, I, I don't want to tempt somebody into trying to, trying to go down a path, they're going to discover that they're going to have to do really, really, really weird architectural things first. Um, so, 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so yeah. So, at some point, um, so there's a thing I, I mentioned real briefly earlier, and I'll mention it real briefly again. Uh, there's uh, this thing called ModDB, which this guy wrote, um, which presents a REST interface. It's an Apache module that talks directly to talks into API on the back end and presents a REST interface on the front end. And it, um, uh, he's written the part that uh, it's pretty much only useful in the multi uh, multi threaded mode of Apache because multi process mode would have the exact same problem. Um, but what I what I've been trying to figure out, and one of these days I'm going to find the right PHP internals hacker to to that can explain this to me. Um, but what I would really like to do is, is take that that same sort of shared you know one shared NDB connection cluster connection object per Apache process in a multi threaded set up and be able to share that. I know I can share it between worker threads in Apache. The question is, is how do I get access to that from PHP? <laughs> What's that? Uh, no, actually, we never be, uh, we keep not being in the same room at the same time. So th this is the problem. Is like it's, it's not a problem, actually, that I care about enough to, to spend a lot of effort. But one of these days, we're going to be talking at a dinner table, I'm sure. And somebody says, oh, well, it's really easy. You just use, you know, and you know, this is how you pass a pointer from one mod Apache module to another Apache module, um, blah, blah, blah. So we'll, we'll see about that. It may or may not ever work. But um, good eyes. I need to fix that. Um, so you can grab the, uh, you can grab the NDB bindings. Um, there's a mailing list, which is NDB connectors at list.mysql.com, which might indicate to you what one of the old names for this project might have been. Um, before it was NDB bindings, uh, and you can, it's a public list that you can sign up for. It's, it's pretty, the traffic on it's pretty dead at the moment. Uh, it has been dead for a while because we keep co-opting other communication sources. Um, uh, and uh, there's an RC, RC channel on Freenode, uh, MySQL NDB, which um, uh, you, we can talk about this and also talk about uh, pretty much anything having to do with, with cluster is that, that uh, IRC channel winds up being a pretty good place for it. And Stuart and I, uh, and a couple of other people are, are pretty much always on there. Um, so if you want to, if you want to get uh, started in building this, so that you can play with it, because at this point you're so excited, you, you're just about to wet your pants, um, and you've, you've just got to, you've got to start messing with code. Um, you need MySQL installed. You need um, uh, so MySQL 5.1 is too old um, for anybody that's, that's been following things. MySQL just got really excited, and they finally released uh, 5.1, um, except that. Cluster is uh, much, the cluster team is much faster moving than, than the other teams. Um, and and 5.1 is like ancient history in, in cluster land. Um, and, and so actually what you really want to be installing at this point, if you're installing a MySQL cluster to, to take a look at it for the first time, is MySQL 5.1 uh, cluster 6.3, um, uh, which is not to be confused. The 6.3 here is a number that is not related to the 5.1 number, um, but we refer to it as 6.3 anyway. Um, and you want at least 6.3. 14, but it, the current thing on the website I think is 6.3.20, so that, that thing isn't, isn't a deal. But there's a patch in 6.3.14 that you need. Um, so. Um, so anyway, the, from, a, from, a, uh, from a code organization standpoint, it's using Swig. I saw, I saw a grimace. Uh, Swig, is, Swig is much better than Swig used to be. Um, the code that it's actually generating at this point is actually not bad. Um, I promise. I, I, I looked at the. I, I looked at, at the. Uh, I actually hack in, in the generated code uh, a, a reasonable amount to do um, you know, debugging of, of various things, and it's actually uh, it, you, you need you need recent swig, old swig, eat lunch, bad babies, beating seals. Uh, but the the recent stuff is actually I'm 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 ridiculously pleased. Depending on the language, because some languages get get more love than the other. The Python bindings in particular are. Um, like most of the operations are, are no copy stuff, and, and it's really it's really uh, really lean stuff, and, and I've been I've been very pleased with it. Um, and they've got Python 3.0 support now for crying out loud. Um, I keep meaning to add Python 3.0 support here, but I just haven't gotten there yet. Um, uh, so Java bindings, well, because um, uh, I've got some specific slides that I stole from another talk that we'll just use. Uh, so the the uh, of the languages, we've got this uh, um, this. 
uh, system of, of using NDB slash and then whatever the sort of language thing is. So, so referring specifically to the Java bindings, they're NDBJ because we need more terms. Oh, is that, is that what all the J stuff is about? Oh, right. Yeah, so, so fun, fun, uh, fun story. I, I did a version of this talk at Java one last year, and when I got there, they have a trademark guy who looks through all your talks to make sure that, that all your stuff is properly marked with trademarks. And also, it turns out that you can't use in that context the word Java by itself. It's either Java technology or Java virtual machine or Java compiler or Java whatever. Like, Java by itself is an unusable word. Um, <laughs> So I was like, I don't know what extra word I should put on the end of Java, but you guys pick one for me, why don't you? <laughs> anyway, um, not to pick on the Java 1 guys. They were actually really nice, other than the fact that they made me vet my talk through a lawyer. Um, so it's, it's Jay and I, uh, for those of you who do anything with Java, any Java people in here? All right, so there's one Java people in here. Um, most Java people hate when I say the word Jay and I. Um, in this case, it's, it's it, the, the, the whole library itself is, is extremely um, fat. It's not just a protocol. Uh, it's, it, it's a cluster membership thing. And so getting a, getting a Java re-implementation of it from scratch is, is a ridiculously large project. Um, there is a guy in Germany working on it. But I, if he surfaces before the next two years are up, I'm going to be very impressed. Um, so a similar thing to what we were looking at before, except now it's in Java. Um, You'll, you'll notice we've, uh, we've added an exception uh, uh, try here because we don't, now we don't have to check for, for error return codes on everything because we're going to throw exceptions. Woohoo! <laughs> Welcome to the 90s. Um, uh, so but pretty much the same, the same general process. We're going to create a connection. We're going to, um, oh, actually, so I, um, this is a little bit more. So uh, when we were just talking a second ago about, about cluster connections, um, this guy right here, as soon as you instantiate this object, you, you now have a, uh, a, a, your thing is a, a full API member of the thing. If you go into, uh, into, into cluster management, you'll see that there's another, there's another node in your cluster. That's, it's a node. Hi, I'm a node. I now have this object. That's, that's sort of what that guy does. Um, you, you connect in, you, you make sure that the cluster is ready, not to, to go into too much detail, because I'm probably already about to run over time. Um, if I know myself, um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna wait. Make sure that all the nodes are up and ready to go. Um, we're gonna we're gonna connect into so the the NDB objects themselves because thank God somebody came up with great names for for what these objects should be. There's definitely should be one object that just should be called plain NDB um, since the anyway. Um, but this is essentially like a database handle. Um, if you're if you're doing you know Perl DBI type stuff or anything that has has the idea of a of a of a of a data this is the thing that you're working with. In general, the the API is not uh, is not thread it's it's not thread safe unless by thread safe you mean if you have one of these NDB objects per thread then you're thread safe. Um, it'll work in that way. Um, so I guess it's thread safe as long as you don't try and access most of it from multiple threads. Um, uh, there's a there's a whole dictionary API that you can use to to get objects from the uh, from the data dictionary because NDB actually has a, a, a full data dictionary, um, and uh, uh, down here we'll we'll get a table object blah blah blah, and so then we can we can uh, pretty much do many of the same things that we did. We're going to grab a so rather than in, in that other in that other C plus plus example that you saw before, we we had a couple different steps. If we got an operation object and then we we ran a method on it read tuple. Um, well, that's actually entirely error prone because there's no way that the compiler can tell you that, that you forgot to run the read tuple thing. And so you just get really weird ass errors. Um, so we wrap that so you've got different types of operations um, that you can, you can pull in that automatically run that for you. It's little, it's little nice things that we like to do for you. Um, so this one actually doesn't have the get value bug that the, that the C++ example had. But we're going we're gonna to get a row where the ID equals 42. We're going to tell it to get the name value out. And then we're going to grab a result set that's got the, the stuff in it. We're going to commit it. And then we're going to loop through the loop through the result set and print it out. It's going to be very exciting. And it's very Java-like. Um, and if we get an exception, then we can print the error message to standard out. Because that's definitely what you should do with your error messages, is just print them to standard out <laughs> and then not exit. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, the next question that everybody ever always, all the Java people always ask me, um, 
uh, anytime I give this talk to Java people, um, is worried about JDBC. How does this, is this JDBC 4, is this JDBC 3, whatever? And I'm like, no, this has nothing to do with JDBC at all. You're never ever going to run SQL statements through this. And that's what JDBC is. It's a driver for running SQL statements. Um, but you know, I, I'm not the world's biggest Pyth uh, Java fan, so, uh, so we can do that exact same thing in Python. And it takes up much, much less screen real estate, because of course we all know that, that Python takes up less screen than Java does. Um, so the, the main difference between the Java and the Python in this case is that the Python's smaller. Um, that's, what's that? Uh, I didn't put in the try except. It'll, it'll just error out with the, with the exception, but yeah. I know, yeah, well that's. Well, it's just one, it'd just be a one try and a, and a thing and an accept at the bottom. So, okay, I, I took out four lines. Um, but, uh, but pretty much the same thing. And at this point, um, pretty, much getting, uh, pretty much getting tired of, of that example. It's, it's really not the world's most exciting example. Um, but we've now seen it in three different languages. Uh, Woohoo! Um, but so I thought we might look at, at something that's slightly more interesting, um, since Python is, is uh, not quite so verbose that we can actually fit an actual program segment that actually does something onto one slide, uh, since we obviously couldn't do that with the Java, which took three slides to do <laughs> a single thing. Um, uh, so, so this is actually, um, I actually cribbed this from, a, from an example program that's in the, in the source, um, but I have used this in general, actually add a, add a client to bulk load data um, into, into a database so we could do some testing. They needed to, they needed to prep the database with like a couple of million records um, and, and just loading, generating and loading that data in was, was becoming really, really slow. Um, so we wrote a thing. The nice thing about here, and, and this is one of the reasons that I wanted to, to stick this up here, uh, and, and I apologize, I think there might even be a, uh, the, the, the looping, I, spent all of three seconds on coming up with the most elegant way to do the, the batching looping. So sorry that that's ugly. Um, but uh, uh, so anyway, so we're going we're gonna to do a, you know, a nested loop here. In our top one, we're going we're gonna to pull a transaction. Um, and then in our, in our, in our in, inner loop here, we're, gonna, we're just going to pop operations on. Because a transaction can consist of, of one or more operations. So what we're going to do here is we're going we're gonna to make a whole bunch of insert operations in this inner loop here with, uh, with auto incrementing value and, and, and adding stuff on to the, uh, adding, adding the, the data that we need to, to insert into the thing, into the operation, then none of this gets transmitted to the database until we run this execute down here. So depending on batch size, we might be, we might be sending 10,000 rows at a time or 100,000 rows at a time to the, to the database um, in, a, in a single network round trip. Um, in, a, in, a pretty, uh, in, in a pretty nice and, and easy manner. Um, and, and doing this actually uh, is able to, to overrun the, 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 the cluster's ability to, to checkpoint stuff to disk uh, pretty quickly. Um, so, which is actually the reason that I, I put in the inner batch. Um, <laughs> I needed to be able to, to adjust the batch size down until the cluster could keep up with the speed that this thing could, could, throw, uh, could throw data at it. Um, uh, and I think we wound up getting uh, yeah, we're inserting at things like, you know, several hundred thousand rows a, a, a second, which means that you can load a million rows really quickly. You don't have to wait two hours for the, for the data set to reload from, you know, from scratch or whatever. Um, so another thing to point out in here, there's, there's this nice little um, get auto increment value call um, that you'll see, which is actually on that database handle. Um, rather than rather than part of a, of another thing, there is potentially a network round trip that happens behind the scenes when you do this. Um, the API itself uh, pulls these in, in in batches. So when you get an auto increment value, um, unless you've got the configuration set at one, um, it's it's gonna it's gonna pull a hundred or a thousand or, or however many you've told it uh, auto increment values from the from the database, and then that that API node will own those. Um, for the for the period of time, so you can you can do all the auto incrementing here outside of the context of uh, of having to ask the database for a value every time, which is also a nice speed uh, thing. Um, so there's another thing that that's actually pretty cool um, that uh, I was going to add some things in, but the um, well, you know, when I do the slides in LaTeX, sometimes doing some things it makes some adding some types of slides harder. Um, <laughs> so so sometimes you decide not to. Um, so there's a, there's a cool, the cool thing that this guy wrote, um, uh, JD wrote, called, uh, called ModMDB, which presents, uh, allows you to take the, um, 
uh, these same sorts of calls back here and map them in, in just an Apache config uh, settings to, um, uh, to, to RESTful, uh, uh, RESTful URLs. So that you, could, you can define several different types of, of operations that you want to go on and then just hit Apache and Apache will do 